Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Janine DeRose uh, running for California Senate uh, District 6. We have Najere Tubai, who is the uh, founder of the Pando Women's Foundation and its uh, executive director, and Robert Griffiths, Griff for Gov, running mm -hmm. as a uh, uh, Jeffersonian Libertarian, or Jeffersonian Democrat, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, for Governor of California. My understanding is that philosophically and ideologically you are, in fact, about as libertarian as you can get. Why the hell are you running as a Democrat? <laughs> I, I get that question from a lot of libertarians. And uh, I did run for president of the United States as a libertarian in the Libertarian Party. Okay. And I was at the national convention. Um, and I, I actually um, attended the Libertarian Party of California's annual convention in Santa Clara last year, participated in the gubernatorial debate, and won it over the other two gentlemen who've since both been endorsed by the LP. Um, but sort of the question came up of what party to run for governor as. Uh, this is the first time I've run in California and in this open jungle primary. And, um, you, you know, I think practically uh, all the pundits were saying that uh, the top two finishers will probably be Democrats, Democratic voters, registered voters outnumber Republicans more than two to one, and libertarians are viewed kind of as a fringe group, unfortunately. So um, I also lean left on some issues like, like the drug war and, and some aspects of immigration. And the top two uh, items in my plan for California as governor, I was getting very positive feedback from Democrats especially. Um, so it seemed practical and it seemed consistent. I've been a Republican, I've been a libertarian, and now I'm a Democrat. What are the top two issues that you were getting uh, the, that positive uh, response on? Uh, well, the first is um, the state's debt. And, uh, you know, my research on the debt is the state is anywhere from, you know, four or five hundred billion in debt to three trillion in debt, depending on how you count the debt. Uh, pension funds and other unfunded liabilities are sometimes included. Uh, but the number I've been working with is about two trillion. And either way you cut it, that's an obscenely large amount of money. And um, uh, the interest on that debt alone is eating up over 20% of our state, county, and municipal budgets. So politicians and bureaucrats, as if the $500 billion a year in tax revenue that is taken from California citizens every year, it wasn't enough. They've borrowed now well over $2 trillion in debts and liabilities and the interest is 20% and that will grow to 30 and 50 and uh, it's just insurmountable. $2 trillion is an amount of money that can never be paid. Um, so when I was looking at the state's fiscal crisis and problems and how to solve it, the debt is what grabbed my eye. I think that's the elephant in the room. And my plan is to restructure that debt. Um, not unlike a bankruptcy, although the state would not be going bankrupt by any means. Um, and some portion of that debt would be defaulted upon. Um, it's going to be defaulted upon, so I think the sooner we wake up to that, the better. And, um, you know, you mentioned that my principles were libertarian. Um, the Austrian School of Economics, as you may know, Richard, is, is, is a very close affinity with those people who identify as libertarian and the Libertarian Party. And I found an Austrian School economist um, down at San Jose State, um, who has been pushing this idea at the federal level for over 25 years. And I had a conversation uh, with him a couple of months ago, and he had never considered doing it at the state level, but when I ran California's numbers by him, he said, yeah, we need to do that here as well. What's his name and what's his uh, plan? Uh, his, his name uh, uh, escapes me at the, at the moment. Um, he's oh. been on the Rubin Report and, okay. and other things. Okay. So he's a pretty, he's respected by Mises, FEE, and Cato, and all the libertarian think, think tanks. Uh, Jeffrey Hummel, actually, is oh, his okay. name. Yeah. Um, and um, so, yeah, you know, the state's two trillion in debt. We're paying about 100 billion in a year in interest, and I'd like to get that 100 billion dollars off the books. Well, just recently, just in the last uh, few weeks, uh, California Governor Jerry Brown has been uh, claiming that the uh, state surplus is projected to top nine billion, and that uh, he's uh, 
uh, taking the, the high road mm -hmm. and saying we don't want to be uh, budgeting for new programs to use up that $9 billion. We need to put it in a rainy day fund. Why the divergence between his uh, surplus of $9 billion and the actual, mm -hmm. uh, as you put it, uh, deficit of, uh, of trillion, uh, billions of trillions? It's, it's smoke and mirrors. There isn't anybody in office right now, especially not Jerry Brown, uh, that want to admit to how much debt the state is in and how much it's grown. Uh, under his terms as governor. By constitutional law or whatever, I, the states cannot run a deficit, correct? But there's the debt exists. They get around it. They okay, get they, around is it. Is they that don't primarily, follow the rules. Yeah, is that primarily because of pen pension guarantees or what? That's part of it. Uh, they're just irresponsible. Most of the rest of us don't spend more than we take in in income, or if we borrow, we do it in the form of a mortgage against something like a house. But politicians, they're not on the hook to pay the debt. The taxpayer is. And you know, generally, rich people don't pay taxes. Poor people do. So the poor and middle class Californians are on the hook for all this debt and all this interest. And the politicians don't care. And the citizens don't know any better. And I'm here to let the citizens know about how much debt they're in. It's at least 50000 per citizen. And 2500 a year goes to interest alone of what everybody here on average pays in taxes, <laughs> in sales tax and income tax. Wow. And it needs to stop. We need to have a governor who says no to debt and no to interest. What is the Hummel plan that you're uh, proposing be adopted? Well, he's, he's not running for office, so you, he's an economist. So no, he, I understand. He, what's he recommending and what are you He's, he's are recommending you default. I use the word restructuring. Uh, Bernie Sanders used the word forgiveness of debt <laughs> when he talked about student <laughs> loan debt. Okay, okay. So if you're talking about default, whose ox gets gored? Who's, who, what bond purchasers uh, get stiffed? That's a great question because um, it's a confronting solution to a confronting problem. Um, but it's not nearly as confronting as doing nothing about it. Um, so when I imagine a holder of state California bonds or county bonds or municipal bonds like San Francisco or Los Angeles, there are two ends of the spectrum. One bondholder is, uh, say, a retired uh, California couple. I'll just call them grandma and grandpa. And they have, let's just say, $100,000 in savings, and they have it all in California bonds. Okay, now $100,000 in savings for retirement probably doesn't sound like a lot of money, but it's much higher than average. Most people have no savings mm -hmm. uh, for retirement or a rainy day fund. Um, but I see grandma and grandpa is getting every penny. Now on the other end of the spectrum, you have institutional investors and hedge funds, let's say not in California, it could be in China or some other country that doesn't vote in California for one thing, um, where they may hold say $10 million of California bonds in a portfolio of hundreds of billions of dollars. So their holdings are just a drop in the bucket. They're investors, they can take a loss. I think at first pass, you know, when we decide, you know, who, who's going to default, we would, we would actually ask bondholders to donate their bonds to the citizens of California and not redeem them for principal and interest. On the second pass, those institutional investors who can afford a haircut, well, we might default on the entire $10 million for them, and it would be a drop in the bucket. It wouldn't even hurt their bottom line that much because they're making, you know, tens of billions of dollars a year. So a $10 million default on California bonds isn't going to hurt them. So we'd have to go through the whole portfolio, bond by bond, owner by owner, and figure out who can afford to take a loss and who can. And in this way, we could erase an over $2 trillion. Debt. How can you do that uh, <laughs> with uh, equal protection of the law and all of the uh, legal niceties that you uh, uh, would be- Wouldn't be equal. Would be bound the, to follow. This is, this, is, this is manning up, uh, so to speak. Uh, not, no, what I'm saying is, take how, would pass, how, how would this uh, muster get, get past a court challenge? Well, but if I'm voted, if, uh, if uh, I'm elected uh, governor, then this will be a mandate from the people, and I we'll just do it. I understand, but how is it going to get past a court challenge, uh, a federal court challenge or a state court challenge? Mm -hmm. Well, then I'll just have I'm to have an army of lawyers with me on this. <laughs> but, but the people will have spoken. This is my top issue, and if the people are behind it, 100%, then I will do my best to get it done. Well, I mean, I agree with, with you every with the concept that right. uh, people who are silly enough to lend money to a bankrupt government deserve to lose every penny. 
I, you know, they, they should not There's be guaranteed. It should be guaranteed that that they will be paid on the backs of taxpayers. I, I agree with the concept. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking about the practicality of it. There will be resistance, but you know, I, I'm willing to run as a populist on this, and I think when the people speak, they get what they want in a democracy, and I'm willing to bank on that. Well, they certainly get what they deserve. Whether they get what they want or not is another question. <laughs> well. Y you know, there'll be health to pay if, if, if I'm blocked on this as governor. So, but first I've got to get elected. Exactly. The most recent polls show Democrats Newsom and Villaraigosa uh, leading with uh, Republicans Cox and Allen in third and fourth place in this uh, uh, two, uh, top two primary. With only a few weeks remaining uh, before the primary, how do you propose to uh, uh, break into the top two? Well, I'm glad you asked me that, Richard, because that's my second plank of my top two, which is... Um, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier off the air how some of those gentlemen who are polling high um, are funded sometimes in the tens of millions of dollars by people who are going to profit in the billions uh, on the governorship of, say, a Gavin Newsom. Um, uh, what I'm proposing to do is something that is done in Australia and something that's talked about being done here, and that is to pay people to vote. So what I'm proposing is that we pay people $400 to vote in the June 5th primary. Now, if 10 million people vote in that primary, that's $4 billion, um, which will be easily paid for with the debt restructuring in the first year, which will save tens of billions of dollars a year. So the way we defeat the special interests, the way we help the common citizen out is, to, is for a politician to, for once to promise something simple, $400, in cash, either deposited into your bank account from your tax return or checks in the mail. So we would pay $400, people $400 to vote on June 5th. And I've asked all the other candidates for governor to match me on this so that we can help people out and get more people involved in the election. And so far, none of them have agreed to match me on this. So and I'm guessing that would be, you know, although it sounds good, it would require the state senate and the state assembly to uh, pass a law making it possible. No, the people will demand it. If I get elected on this, they will oh, demand yeah. so it. So it would be it would be after the executive fact. order. Checks will be cut, and you know if judges and people in the assembly want to fight me on it, they're going to lose in, in the public opinion battle because those people are going to want the four hundred. So you would bucks. promise to pay the four hundred dollars after elected. Yeah, and you know it's a promise I'd have to keep, or people would storm the governor's mansion. Okay, uh, top three or four issues for you. Well, those are my top two, the debt okay. and uh, encouraging people to vote with $400 to vote. Uh, number three is we were talking about some, uh, some uh, legislation that didn't make any sense earlier. Um, so just to keep things simple, I would veto all legislation, all four years. <laughs> I, everything that comes out of the Assembly and the State Senate is completely ridiculous. You talked about a bill that you're the person you're running against, the incumbent, wants people to come into people's houses and take their children away. They're not raising their kids according to the state standard. Mm. I don't even have to think twice about vetoing that. So, you know, obviously, there, there, there's once in a blue moon, there's legislation that makes sense. But the things that are coming out of case, the assembly... Uh, the, the veto would be overridden, and that's fine. Well, there are, there are coalitions you can build in the Senate and the Assembly with either Democrats or Republicans, depending on the issue, to make sure that they can't override. Now, obviously, a large enough group, but I've just been reading articles that overriding vetoes pretty much never happens in California, and I would try to make sure it never would. Uh, matter of fact, I'd be looking to repeal, you know, on the order of 90% of existing legislation, which is, which is a bunch of nonsense like the bill you mentioned. <laughs> Um, the uh, uh, pension problem, which you touched upon uh, when you're talking <laughs> about the debt, is mm -hmm. obviously huge. Uh, right now, CalPERS can only cover about two-thirds of the uh, pension obligations that have been promised to uh, retired teachers and uh, bureaucrats, uh, state, local, uh, statewide, and local uh, level throughout the state of California. Uh, how would you uh, be able to make it possible for the uh, pension prices to be covered. Is that, is that part of your uh, default on bond uh, proposal? It could. You know, as I understand it, there are contractual obligations where California state employees have been promised guaranteed amounts of money regardless of how poorly or well their money is invested. 
um, by uh, the folks who run their pension funds. Um, and those folks have made some promises that they can't keep. Well, the promises, is, there's, there's, a, there's two sides to it. Promises have been made, which are kind of silly. Uh, one of those uh, promises that gets ma being made all the time is that you are able, as a state employee, able to retire uh, on the average of your last, I guess, two or three years of, of service. And mm -hmm. the last two or three years of service, you do a lot of overtime and you do uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, bumping up of what your uh, income is for mm -hmm. those last two years. And it's based upon that, on, that, uh, on that number, which, of course, is inflated compared to the rest of your career. So that's a problem with the, the unions, public employee unions in particular, negotiating really sweet deals with uh, politicians that uh, should never have been, and promises never should have been made in the first place. The other side of it is, is that CalPERS and the other others who are managing uh, pension funds have uh, historically been going after an 8% return or making their plans based uh -huh. on an 8% return on bonds and stocks. And, and of course, in a, in a they're only less getting about three or two. Yeah, less than one percent world mm -hmm. for for a lot of bonds. That's simply not possible. Yeah, they're lying to their employees. Uh, so you know, you've to got, our employees. Yeah, you've got you've got two issues going on there: overpromising and uh, overpromising uh, as far as what the pension benefits will be, and overestimating how much you're going to make on on, on the uh, the pension fund investment. Yeah, retirees are going to have to get less, um, <laughs> and to some degree taxpayers are going to have to fund some of the difference. And with my debt restructuring program, we will have more money to help fund pensions. But at the same time, you know, I, I'm going to make sure that uh, these unrealistic promises are not being made by uh, the, the union bosses and, and the managers of the pension funds. You know, we can't give them a blank check. That well, the, the California the taxpayer then has to, mm -hmm. to give them these fat retirements. One of the reasons why we have such fat pensions is mm -hmm. because the, prisons, the prison guards union, the uh, police officers union, mm -hmm. uh, the teachers union, and, and a whole lot of other public employee unions have uh, really, really strong lobbying and uh, mm -hmm. uh, influence at the state legislature, uh, as well as in the governor's office, and have been able to you know, basically negotiate pretty, pretty sweet, sweet deals. How do you stop that? And maybe you have an idea on that too, Janine. Well, you're going to be in the Senate. It's just going to we just going to have to push back <laughs> on it. Um, and at the same time, those are real big voting blocks, and I can't just look at the camera and say, "Yeah, we're going to take your retirement away because it's unfair." So, you know, we're going to have to cut it both ways. The, the taxpayer is going to have to cover some of it, but we have to start pushing back these unrealistic promises that are being made to pensioners because they don't deserve to be lied to either. So somebody has to show some discipline. And I think we can expect to see that uh, from a governor with me as governor and with people like you in the Senate. You know, we will push back and, um, you know, we may have to break some rules to do it, but uh, these guaranteed contracts, that, that needs to come to an end and a guaranteed 8% return. That's just, that's fantasy. That's not reality. And so we're going to have to short them some of the money that they think is coming in order for them to, to get the message that they can't keep pushing. You're talking about vetoing all bills. You're not going to veto Janine's uh, deregulatory reform bill, are you? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I'm glad you mentioned regulation because in addition to vetoing all the bills, uh, I'm not going to enforce a single regulation. The, the regulations are enforced reporting up through the governor's office, and I'm going to put somebody like, uh, you know who Adam Kokesh is? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If I put a guy like Adam Kokesh, a libertarian in charge of enforcing regulations, they won't be enforced. So yeah, whether that's gonna, enforcing... You're going to find the fishermen to, to, to enforce the, reg, the fishing regulations. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. So um, it, there's, and, and there's an unwritten rule in government, which is that governors and bureaucracies very selectively enforce regulations. And, and I would transition us away from a regulatory model of governance uh, you know, we can rely on common law and jury trials to make sure that people don't get hurt and don't get stolen from. Regulations written by bureaucrats, written by lobbyists, poorly enforced, and it's pay to play for large corporations. So, you know, one way I'm, I'm going to help address the housing crisis, all the housing builders tell me about what you mentioned, something like $10,000 just to break ground on a house. No, it's 45 to 90000 Okay, it's 000. ridiculous. So we just wouldn't enforce any of that. You could put a moratorium on it. Yeah, I mean, that we'd obey the letter of the law. I'm not going to do anything that's going to get me sent to prison or kicked out of office. But effectively, the word on the street will be regulations are not being enforced 
do what you want, but if you hurt somebody or steal from somebody, you can be sued, which is the way it's supposed to be anyways. So this state is tied in red tape and regulations, and with me, you get a governor who says, don't worry about the regulations, I'm not enforcing them. <laughs> uh, California has a, a long-term <laughs> out-migration problem. Uh, there mm -hmm. are more taxpayers uh, leaving the state than are moving here from other states. Mm -hmm. uh, is the uh, regulatory situation and the uh, debt situation primarily the respons re responsible for that, or is, there, or is there something more? Well, there's more. There's taxes. Uh, the taxes in this state are way too high, uh, whether it's uh, personal income tax, sales tax is in the neighborhood of 10% or more in some counties. Uh, the state income tax is pretty high. Um, I'm only running on one tax cut, and that is that the California state corporate income tax for small business only, and by small business I mean about 2,000 employees or less, you know, the rules around what's small and what's, you know, so I don't want to give a tax cut necessarily to Walmart or Google. More than half of the economy is small business, and by cutting California corporate income tax, in half, that will help small business and the small business employee, and that's more than half of the state. And those people vote. So um, the economy of the state, other than the big tech companies where people can come in and make a couple hundred thousand dollars working for Google or somebody like that in San Francisco or Silicon Valley, most people here in the Central Valley make money off things like agriculture and whatnot. And so to cut their corporate, the, at least the state corporate income tax in half, and obviously I gotta get that through the legislature and the state senate, um, but that's the only tax cut I'm proposing at first. Um, so yeah, we need to cut regulations by not enforcing them, and I'm starting with just one tax cut. I think we need to address things like the debt to get our fiscal house in order before we can go cutting taxes the way that Trump and Congress have. And I like tax cuts, but they're running the federal deficit up way over 22 trillion it'll soon be. So. We need to be responsible, we need to cut taxes, we need to get rid of regulations. So I, I think I'm addressing all of those fronts. One well. of the things that you're doing is c somewhat reminiscent of what Trump is doing. I'm talking about uh, not enforcing regulations or uh, cutting back on, on the uh, implementation of new regulations. Well, he's doing some of that. The Trump administration is saying uh, we will uh, get rid of two regulations for every new regulation we write, which I think is a great idea. Well, that's cute, but the why problem, not just not enforce any of them? Well, I mean, fine. he's like he's dancing doing, around the reality doing, of he's just... He's doing a little of that, too. Yeah. But <laughs> the problem is that you can do that if you're elected Trump, as elected, can do that for the four years or the eight years or mm -hmm. however long you're in office. But once you're out of office, those re regulations will come back with a vengeance. Right. Well, then we'll just get them repealed yeah, through the assembly and the Senate if we with, can. We saw that with Sch Schwarzenegger's uh, reign. Uh, <laughs> I worked for the state at the time, and it does not go over well when you go after state workers. Um, their their pensions and, and benefits are, they're not a promise, they're a contract. They're sacrosanct. Yeah, yeah there's something, so what you wanna do, I, I, I guess I have a much uh, more gentle approach, but I, I love your passion because I hear that, you know, I'm in libertarian circles. But if you start creating laws that affect the incoming employees and you put in things that are the practicalities that we need to see, um, especially in the local level, because that hasn't been happening. State reform's been taking place and the actuaries have gotten into line because of the new Gatsby standards, which are the counting standards. So we've seen some good changes on the state level where the pension um, liability is getting under control, but we need to see that on the local level. When you're talking about incoming employees, you can set the contract however you see fit without having a re complete revolt. The most important thing we can do is a cultural change where you have the people behind your back when you're making those changes. So getting these thoughts and ideas out there and letting people know you shouldn't be tied up in regulations, you shouldn't be taxed to death, you shouldn't be struggling to the point where you have to make the sacrifice to move out of California, which is a decision a lot of people are having to make. Mm -hmm. uh, but you want the people to understand that before you go and do these things because sometimes you can actually end up with a revolt. That would be my only caution. In California, one of the uh, elephants in the room is the, the whole issue of water. Water, mm. uh, the uh, possession and use of water uh, is usually decided politically uh, rather than through voluntary uh, trade uh, of property rights in water. Uh, the result is literally centuries of water wars between Mono Lake and Los Angeles, between salmon and Northern California, 
irrigation projects uh, in the Central Valley between uh, uh, Smelt and Central Valley farmers and uh, mm -hmm. uh, more globally between the state of Jefferson, uh, Northern mm -hmm. California and Southern California. How would each of you envision solving the, uh, or moving I should say, the, uh, the, the problem of uh, the political decisions on water to market decisions on water in California, Janine and, and, and uh, Griff? I think that's a good idea. I mean, water rights are sort of a complex issue. You know, I don't necessarily pretend to be an expert on California's. I know if we get our fiscal house in order, things like the Oroville Dam, which was nearly a debacle when, when that thing almost flooded, you know, where about 100,000 people live. Um, but, you know, in terms of my campaign, I, I think water is, is sort of a thorny issue. And, and while I think there are some reforms, you know, to make it more market driven and less political, I think that's a good idea. But I'm not going to die on the hill over water. Um, it's, uh, you know, I think there are opportunities there, but it's just, it's just not the biggest opportunity. I think some of these other things I mentioned just feel bigger to me. Do you So water is so incredibly important in California, and we, we see these trends of drought and then overabundance. And there was infrastructure planned um, during, previous to Governor Brown's first set of terms. And he eradicated that infrastructure. So basically he got rid of the planned opportunities to be, uh, just, you know, have a little forethought. You know, okay, we know that it's going to be drought season and then we know it's going to be rainy season and we need to collect and store. Other, I mean, Nevada's figured this out. Other, other states with kind of like inclement weather have figured out that we need to store our resources. And this hasn't been an issue, but yet in California, we have it as an issue. And then the very same person who caused this crisis, it was a caused crisis. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the, it's similar with the not um, keeping dams maintained and other things. And then his solution was to remove water rights from people that have held these water rights for hundreds of years in their mm -hmm. families. And somehow, so now we have a state and federal control of all of our water rights as the solution to his you know, problem that he created. So this is all yeah. very political. It's all money well, We need to go back to those property rights, either assign them fairly or to their original owners. Yeah, it's absolutely good, it's a good, big mess. good, good place to, to, to close. Mm -hmm. We'll see you again next week on the Libertarian Counterpoint. On uh, the internet at www.accesssacramento.org, uh, channel 17 in Sacramento, on cable channels all over California, as well as on YouTube and on Facebook. See you again next week. Thank you very much for being part of the show.